legend Warwick Davis. Good afternoon, Warwick. Hello. Welcome again. Hi. Hello. Looks like I should be on that seat. Actually, <laughs> watch him today. Hello. Um, welcome, everybody. We're going to have a Q&A with uh, Warwick. As was explained, I will ask some general questions first. Um, so, Warwick, yesterday we talked about this not being your first visit to Belgium. Uh, we did mention chocolates and beers. Did you taste any beers yesterday? And I, did, I actually don't really drink. Oh, okay. I ate a lot of waffles. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and yesterday we played a little party game uh, for you. For those of you who don't know, in the UK there's a party game named or called Name Three Famous Belgians. You failed yesterday, I'll have to admit. So I will not put you to the test today. I'm just going to ask you. you I've been I'm studying up. All right. Give me five famous Belgians. Oh, I can't get five. <laughs> I can do Audrey Hepburn. Yes. John Claude Van Damme. Okay. And uh, well, that's it. <laughs> there must be more famous Belgians, surely. Yes, quite a few. Uh, René Magritte, the painter, uh, Adolf Sax, who invented the saxophone, and some others. But I was going to ask you, you're British. Name the three most famous Brits. Winston Churchill comes to mind straight away. Um, famous Brits. Um, Probably most of the cast of Harry Potter. The boy wizard. Indeed, him, yes. Well, as a disclaimer, though, what I say is, uh, because of the strike, anything I mention today, please don't ever watch it. <laughs> None of these things are any good, so don't watch them. You're anti-promoting stuff. Anti, that's it. But that makes people do it more, doesn't it, that yes. kind of anti thing. Um, so, who would be a personal hero of yours? Personal hero? Um, in acting, I suppose, Will Ferrell is a comedy hero of mine. Also, the late, great John Candy as well. Um, Chevy Chase. Um, various comedy actors like that. Steve Coogan. Uh, Ricky Gervais, dare I say. So, so yeah, that's the list. All comedy actors, is that a yeah. way you want to go or something you would like to do? Well, I kind of did go that way during my career. Um, at the start, it was all kind of serious roles, fantasy roles, that kind of stuff. And I always wanted to do comedy. And then I got the opportunity to do that in um, Life's Too Short, working with Ricky and Extras. Uh, and um, yeah, since then I've developed my own style of comedy. Um, so yeah, I love comedy. I mean, it's a gift to be able to make people laugh. It's really, really lovely as a performer to do that. And when you say your own style of comedy, what should I think of? Well, it's, um, I mean, if anybody's ever been to any of the Star Wars celebrations and seen my shows there, it's kind of, that's my style of comedy. Self-deprecating, um, just making fun of people just enough so they don't feel, you know, bad themselves. But just, just having fun with the audience, really, about the subject. And Star Wars, I mean, it's a serious um, movie, but uh, I think there's a lot of comedy to be had from it. And is it like a one-man show? Um, well, the Star Wars celebrations were me basically doing what you're doing, but um, I wasn't quite as polite as you are. <laughs> I can throw in some curse words if you want to, but... Uh... I don't mean that, I mean uh, <laughs> you're being nice to me at the moment. Oh, <laughs> I can change if you want to, but no, yeah, uh, I see what you mean. Um, you've done shows, you've done theatre, you've done movies, television. Any favourites? Uh, well, nothing quite beats live theatre. I mean, in front of an audience, you kind of never have a chance to do take two. If you make a mistake, that's it, it's out there. Uh, so, theatre getting live feedback is a great sort of discipline. You know, you make sure you know your lines and you're on your game. Because being a movie actor, you can become a bit lazy. Because you always know you can just go back and do it again. So, on the first take, you don't sort of bother if you're not disciplined. It's only when you get to the second and third and realise they're running out of time, you try a bit harder. Yeah, so definitely for me, it's, um, it's theatre. Right. It's a good discipline. When you say you don't read a bottle for the first take, do you remember which was the highest number of retakes you ever had to do? I think on the Harry Potter films, we went up in the 30s. In the 30s? Yeah. Just to get it right. I mean, it was a very specific thing. I was on Star Wars as well because you've got a lot of technical things going on. You've got droids and things, things that are remote controlled to get in the right place, and that doesn't always work out okay. So if they decide they can't fix it in post, 
they'll have you do another take and it can get up into the high 30s sometimes. Can you stay focused? Because if you have to say the same bloody line for 30 takes in a row, it's like, you know, whatever. Well, you have to stay focused. I mean, that's kind of your job as an actor, is to kind of stay in the moment and get it, get it right. And when you get to that level, you don't want to be the one who does it wrong. I mean, you have to do another one, because everyone's getting a bit bored by that point. So you, you then kind of up your game to make sure that um, you're not the one who makes the mistake. And I assume sometimes you think like, this was a good shot, but then the director says, let's do it again. Well, they've got their own vision as a director, so they see in their head what they want to see in the finished product. And as actors, we don't always see the same thing. But then sometimes as actors, we can judge our own performance and go, could I do one more or whatever? I don't often do that. I let the director be the decider. All right. And, and out of curiosity, you know, a certain George Lucas, you might have heard of him. Uh, does he, is he the kind of guy who goes for reshoots and reshoots, or is he happy with the first take? Um, George doesn't do a lot of takes, he settles for um, what he gets, because he knows he can go back in and fix it with ILM's help. So he kind of takes, he sees one performance he likes from one actor, he knows he can kind of splice it up and join it all together in post, which I think he did a lot in Phantom Menace with the scenes around the, the table with uh, young Anakin. If you watch any documentaries, you'll see how that's all been done. But um, yeah, so George relies on things being fixed later on as opposed to getting it in the can on the day. Right. Uh, going back to theatre, uh, the Q&A earlier with Graham, we um, were talking about, you know, going blank. All of a sudden you're standing there and your lines, you can't remember them. Did you ever have it? I have, yeah. I sort of fill it in. I don't just stand there and say nothing. I go, hmm, yes, yes. I just keep doing that until the thought comes to me again. Uh, but it is, it's a terrible feeling. Uh, you just uh, you don't know where to go. Because, um, you know, people believe that there's somebody with a script throwing you your lines off stage, but that's not always the case. You just have to kind of dig deep and come up with your line. Or hope the actor you're working with on stage gives you a hint of what it might be. Like, say you'd forgotten to say, um, where's he going, Mr. Bond? The other actor might say to you, do you want to ask me where the other person is? You know, something like that. To help oh. out. Graham told about the fact that there's two kinds of actors. There's the one which will help the other one out, and that's the other kind who just looks at you and go like, yeah, suffer a bit. What yes. kind of you are you? Well, we also play a game on, on stage where we try and put the other actor off as well. So as you're talking to somebody else, you'll start looking elsewhere, like you see something else, and distract them. Or pretend they maybe have something up their nose. You, you look at them and keep going like that. Try and throw them as well. Then they get all conscious about is there something I need to move? Uh, so yeah, that's a lot of fun as well. We also do a game when we have a word of the day. So the word might be newspaper, but you have to try and get into one of your speeches in the, in the production. But the words aren't always quite as polite as newspaper. It might be underwear, knickers, bras, or something like that. You have to try and say that within your speech so it's unnoticeable to the audience. Let's try that game. Try to throw a knicker in one of your arms. <laughs> Okay, so, I mean, you've been acting for like over 40 years, um, things have changed. What's the biggest change in the industry for you in those 40 years? Uh, the biggest change, I mean, certainly there's more roles for now disabled people. I mean, diversity is becoming the kind of buzzword at the moment. Um, but within technology, I mean, uh, filmmaking is totally different now. Everything is digital, so there's no more reloading of the camera which used to take a long time to put a new film reel in and thread it through. That would take a few minutes. Now it's just get another memory card and put that in. And also what you can achieve now in post-production is, um, is pretty much anything you can imagine. So your work as an actor on a set which doesn't exist, your work with another character that doesn't exist. So you have to be very good at imagining things. So being an actor now is more like being a, a child again having to have this imagination that can project in front of you this imaginary world that the director has described to you and sort of immerse yourself in it. So when you work on a project like Harry Potter or Willow, it's about kind of really immersing yourself in that world and engaging with it, even though most of it doesn't actually exist in reality. And I once saw Samuel L. Jackson who was asked uh, by Graham Norton, like, when your movie, do you watch yourself in the movie? He said, like, of course, I love, love to watch myself in movies. Do you like seeing yourself? 
You know, I don't mind watching myself um, because I use it as a learning experience. Uh, you know, as I watch, I think, you know, could I have done that better? You know, that gesture doesn't really work, especially when you work in prosthetic makeups because, you know, you're wearing sort of two or three inches of silicone rubber on your face. So you're really not sure how it's moving. I mean, I rehearse in a mirror before I work in those makeups. But not until the production actually comes out am I sure how it's actually moving. So when I watch it back, I can then learn, like, oh, I should have pushed my face a bit more for that movement there, because you really can't see the fact that I'm sort of grinning. So yes, it's a, it's a learning experience for me. Have you seen every movie and every series you've ever played in? You know, I don't think I have. Um, now and again, there'll be something on YouTube, a clip of something that I've been in that I haven't seen. Uh, not because I was embarrassed, but just because I've never got around to actually watching it. Yeah, that's quite fun to see something you, you haven't seen for years. Especially looking back as you get older as well, you think, oh wow, look how I looked back then. And that's why I think when we, when we see an actor in person, like you're seeing me now, you might think, gosh, he's aged a bit, he looks a lot older. Because the last thing you saw of me, it might have been from 25 years ago. But you're not thinking that at all, are you? You look Thank great. You I'll pay you later. Thank you. <laughs> and do you, I mean, when you go see a movie in which you are, do you take friends and family, or do you go like, oh, please do not sit next to me? Um, well, if I'm really proud of a series that I've done or a movie, I might arrange a special screening just for friends and family, and invite everyone along, have cakes and things, and we'll watch the project together. So, for example, Life's Too Short, I arranged a screening for friends and family. We watched the entire series on a Sunday morning, and the same with Idiot Abroad as well. Wow. I made a big cake for Carl Pilkington, he's got a round head, a very round cake. It was great. Right, I can imagine some people in the audience, they go like, wow, I want to have a life like yours, I want to become an actor. Any tips? Any tips? Um, well, don't go after the fame, or the money, or the recognition. Just go out there and act because you love acting and you love performing. Now, if right now you want to get up on this stage and entertain everyone in this room, then you should be an actor. And don't be disheartened as well, because you have to have a lot of tenacity, a lot of determination, willing to get knocked down and come back up again, because you'll get good reviews, you'll get bad reviews as well. And you can't really listen to that and let it stop you. But I would say anyone who wants to be an actor, you should go for it, definitely. Join local theatre groups, get some experience, and hopefully you'll get spotted and get an agent. And that's it. Good luck. <laughs> Because you do need luck as well. Yes, and a good agent, and a good lawyer. Always need a good lawyer. And a good plastic surgeon. <laughs> no, this is all real. Um, you, you talked about good reviews and bad reviews, and, and you often now read actors say, I don't go online because social media has become very negative sometimes. Do you read about comments on your films or on your personal page? No, I mean, I post on Twitter if I want to promote something, but. I don't really dip in and read stuff very often. You know, I just find it's very easy for people to kind of write things online. Unless they're willing to come and talk to me in person about whatever it is, the criticism, then uh, you know, I'm not really fussed about reading it. Um, but everyone's entitled to an opinion, surely. Uh, but yeah, I don't tend to read things like that. Uh, reviews are very kind of subjective, aren't they? Um, and I've seen some great productions in my time and think, you know, why are they writing such bad things about this? This is a great show. So it's a very personal opinion of the actual critique. Yeah, and, and I, I think if you dig into social media, there's too much negativity sometimes and it can hurt yourself, so it's probably better not to go there. It could be very damaging. I mean, my wife and I often comment, you know, how great it was. We grew up in the 80s. What a great time it was to be a teenager. You know, and our kids now are kind of 20 and 25, I think. Uh, you know, what they have to put up with in terms of social media and you know, their own kind of outlook is quite challenging, I think, for a young person these days. Whereas we were carefree, all that mattered was whether our bikes had air in the tyres. You know, it was a much simpler life being a youngster back in the 80s. Yeah, you just went out and you said, I'll see you tonight, and nobody knew where you were. And then... Absolutely, there was no tracking, nobody was scared of anyone. It was yeah. much, much better. It was a more carefree time, as you said. Yes. Now, you have kids. Um, how has that changed you? 
having kids. Um, well, I think you see the world through their eyes, don't you, when you have kids? You know, when you take them anywhere, you kind of see see their wonder in the in the situation and the surroundings, and then you take on a new kind of love for that thing. I mean, I remember the first time we took our children to Disney World. You know, it's the most wonderful place anyway, even as a grown-up. But then you start to see in a whole new light, you know, the wonder and how, how fabulous it is um, through their eyes. Also, it made me start thinking about the projects I was taking on. You know, I stopped doing horror movies when my kids were born. I just, I started to see them for what they were. It's like, do I really want to be making this sort of entertainment? And so I, um, I kind of stopped saying yes to those. So that's why there's only Leprechaun 1 to 6. <laughs> I say only 1 to 6, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and your kids, were they like, wow, hey, I got a famous father, or was it like, oh, Jesus Christ, why? No, they were more kind of played it down. You know, if you mention that sort of thing in school, you get pummeled. So they would play it down and not talk about it, but the kids would soon find out because of the internet and that sort of thing. And my son, unfortunately, happens to look, well, no, fortunate for him, he looks a lot like me as well, so when he walks around, people mistake him for me and shout, hey, Warwick. So he, he writes to me on text and Dan, I keep getting recognized as you, and he gets really fed up with that. You should so try you gotta use it. You should try him as a stand-in for conventions, you know, when I could, I get to do my signing and stand right. hotel. Um, Final question for me before we take some questions from the audience. Um, sure. When was the last time you did something for the first time? Well, that's deep, isn't it? The last time I did something for the first time. What about the first time I did something for the last time? All right. That's impossible to answer, though, isn't it? Okay, the last time I did something for the first time. Oh, gosh. There you put me on the spot with this one. I wish I'd asked you for this one earlier. The last time I did something for the first time. And it feels like it should be something like skiing, but that's been years. Um, I'll let you think about it while I ask what Graham told Absolutely. Me. Graham told a story about the, um, the never drop in New Zealand where they tricked him into, you know, it's like a huge swing, 100 meters down. And he told the horror story about sweating and weeping. He said, I'm never going to do that again. So is there anything like full of adrenaline you did? You got well, I, I sat and watched that. I was on a quad biking tour, and we sat below the little platform where they jump off there. I mean, it's massive, it's crazy. Um, I mean, I've jumped off high towers, the Macau Tower in Macau. I did a, um, a controlled descent from that, 750 feet. I mean, the first kind of 50 feet is terrifying, but then as soon as you reach that kind of terminal velocity, it becomes like you're flying, it's the most amazing experience. But yes, I was terrified. You know, for me being three foot six, you know, I do get afraid of heights. Just not used to it. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's your turn to ask any questions. Don't be shy. I mean, there's a microphone there, so if anybody has a question, just raise your hand. Uh, just speak clearly in the microphone. Any Nickers questions are appreciated. Thank you. There, it's on. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you for coming to Belgium, first of all. I, uh, I grew up with uh, watching you in uh, a lot of projects, I'm not allowed to name. Um, my question for you is, you've probably done other conventions as well, is there a question that you've been asked that you think that was a very uh, surprising question, that's a question that I really loved answering? So your question is, have I been asked a surprising question? <laughs> Sorry, not original. But <laughs> you're having to avoid all the projects and characters thing, aren't you? That's why you're coming with that. Or, um, if, or is there a question maybe about your personal life or, or about you that you would like to ask, that you would like somebody else to ask you? Um, Sorry. I mean, pretty much in my life I've been asked every question there is, is to be asked. Um, oh boy. I'm still going to answer your question. <laughs> I've got a whole queue of questions now. I might just say knickers and leave. <laughs> It's an answer to any question, you know, like niggers, 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 and you're fine, so... Uh... Okay, we'll have the next one, I might come back to that, maybe. Yeah, I, I was wondering, um, you mentioned earlier that there was a big difference between making movies earlier, like in the 80s and now, and um, so what did you like better, uh, making the, the movie well or the TV show now, considering all the technological changes and sets um, and stuff? You know, I think I preferred making the movie. I was 17 years old, very naive very young, 
So all the action sequences didn't feel like they were too much hard work. I wanted to do the stunts instead of avoiding them. Uh, yeah, everything was very fresh and I was excited. Whereas, you know, being 53 and going back to the character, although the performance side of things I loved, but the physicality of the whole project was really tough. I mean, it's pretty brutal conditions and, yeah, being a bit older now, I'm a bit creakier than I was. Fortunately, though, I mentioned my son Harrison. Uh, he was a very good stunt double for me and photo double, so whenever the going got tough, I just sent him in. One funny thing Harrison said, though, you know, he'd be waiting on the, on the side of the set to do something and uh, he'd often get called much earlier than me in the morning. So I'd wander on about sort of eight o'clock and he'd go, oh great, there goes the limelight. <laughs> so I always took the focus of him when I turned up. All right. Thank you. Uh, First on the left. Uh, thank you for the evening, Belgium. And what was the country that you loved the most to visit for personal or for business? Did you catch the question? Yeah, the country you liked visiting most on a personal, the most, yeah, the most beautiful country. Well, of course it's Belgium. Ah. Uh, it I mean, the beauty of the, the journey from the city centre to here is second to none. <laughs> lovely stadiums, buildings, there's the lovely church. And what's that big thing with all the balls all over it? <laughs> what's that called? The Atomium. The Atomium. It's like an what is it, a sculpture, or does it represent something in the it's atmosphere, in the planets? It's an atom, which has been reversed. Yes, of course it's magnified. So, uh, it's and it's a national symbol for Belgium. You know, you've got the Eiffel Tower for France. That's nine balls. balls is our <laughs> national nine symbol. Balls. A load of balls represents Belgium. <laughs> yes. But Lovely. after Belgium, which is the second most beautiful after. country you visited? Um, New Zealand, probably. Been there several times, shooting Willow and the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, yeah, that's the second most beautiful. My favourite place in the world, though, I think, is the Lake District. Wow. And recently went to the south of France as well. I didn't realise that was quite so nice. They're very glamorous. We went cruising around on a ship. On a ship, I say, a boat was a boat, not a ship. We went past some ships in our little boat, and they were worth a fortune. If you're if you're in a boat down there and you sort of Google the name of a ship, you realise who owns it, and you can learn how much it's worth. We went very close to one, a bit too close to one that was worth 149 million pounds. Had a lift in it and everything. Yeah, it was pretty impressive. How would you call your boat? How do I want? How would you call your boat if you had a boat? What would I call it? Oh, I had a good name for a boat. I can't remember what it was. Um, sink or swim? Yes. Uh, just came up with that one. All right. Any further questions? Who has the microphone? Yeah, go on. Hi. Sir. Um, as we mentioned it, you work with your kids, like acting is a family business for the Davis, it seems. Uh, is it something that you encourage for your kids to do? And um, in any ways, how does it feel to work with your children? I mean, if anything, I sort of discouraged it from, from their kind of perspective when they were younger, because, um, you know, I realized how challenging it can be. You know, and it's a difficult profession. There are times of great feast and there are times of famine. So I tried to discourage them from doing it, but my daughter nonetheless saw an audition for a role in a children's BBC drama and went for it called The Dumping Ground. She got the part and was very successful in it. And um, my son then also got the bug and wanted to act. As I mentioned, worked with me on Willow and he's been in Harry Potter as well and Star Wars. So yeah, I tried to discourage them, but it only uh, made them do it more. That's kids for you, though. That's kids for you. All right, person in the middle. Um, hello. Oh. Hello, my name is uh, Sami. Nice, nice to meet you. Um, I have a question. Um, when you did makeup and you're done, and you saw yourself in the mirror, um, how does it feel? When, uh, when I started out. When you got makeup. How, makeup. how does it feel to look at yourself in the mirror? Oh, it's pretty amazing. I mean, especially the makeups on Harry Potter. Let's take the, uh, the Goblin Grip Hook, for example. That's a four and a half hour prosthetic makeup process. So I basically sit in a makeup chair from 4 a.m. I usually fall asleep and then kind of wake up, you know, with a big nose, big ears, look in the mirror and go, okay, we're getting there. <laughs> but then they put the black contact lenses in and the teeth. And looking back at me in the mirror is nothing of me. It's a completely different person. 
you know, I don't even see my own eyes looking bad because I've got the lenses in. So that's a very uncanny, kind of weird experience. Um, but nonetheless allows me to go in and create this character that is nothing like myself. So that's quite liberating, it's really fun. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So you literally fall asleep. Yeah, I mean, it's very early. And it's quite, it's, I wouldn't know, it's not relaxing, it's sticky and horrible and smelly. But yeah, you've got nothing, you might as well have a nap and just kind of let the pain go on outside of your consciousness. Yep. Okay, another person in the middle. Please stand up and ask your question. Hello. Um, my question is, are there, are there any actor or director you would uh, dream of working with or did you... Any or actors I dream to work with? Yes. <laughs> or any directors? I haven't worked with Steven Spielberg as yet. I've met him, but not worked with him. Uh, actors I'd love to work with, Will Ferrell, in some sort of comedy. Uh, and that's it, that, those two ticked. So a Will Ferrell comedy directed by Steven Spielberg. It's never going to happen. <laughs> well, Barbie 2 or something, and you could be playing in there, yes. <laughs> there were no little dolls, though, were there? No. Little tiny ones. Yeah, but Will Ferrell was in there. All right. Uh, we got time for one final question. Who will conclude this Q&A? All right, make it a good one. Go on. Okay, so um, uh, first hello. So uh, actor like Peter Dinklage, I've been saying that a uh, small size actor should uh, be hired more for a talent rather than uh, the gimmick of being small. Do you have uh, anything more to add to that? Uh, or do you agree with that? So I didn't catch all the small size actors. Can you hold on. Can you say it in French and I'll translate? Okay. Uh, y a des acteurs comme Peter Dinklage qui disait uh, que les, les acteurs de petite taille devraient plutôt uh, être embauchés pour leur talent plutôt que le gimmick qu'ils sont petits. Donc, uh, okay. qu'est-ce qu qu'ils ont? Perhaps better. <laughs> It's a question about knickers, really. Oh, really? Was that what it was? <laughs> no. The thing is, somebody said that you shouldn't be. Uh, engaging uh, smaller people because of their size, but because of their talent, that's the only thing that matters. Would you agree with that, or do you think that both should be taken into play? I mean, you should consider both. Um, you know, an actor should be the right person for the job. Now, if the character is short, then you should use a short actor to play that role. Um, and you're, to find that correct actor, you're still cast amongst hundreds of short actors. No, when we did Willow, although the character was written for me, George Lucas and Ron Howard, they still did a casting call all over the world. So I had to re-audition for a role that I'd already been considered for, uh, to win it for myself, you know, prove that I had the ability. I think you should always have to prove that you're a good performer. It shouldn't just be about your being the right height for the job. Okay, then let me finish with some controversy, if you will allow me. Okay. You don't have to answer, but because of what you just said, for Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, there was some controversy that the dwarves were played by, well, high people. What's your stand on that? Well, it's funny, you know, how any of you ever met John Rhys Davies at any of these events? Yes. He's a lovely man, as you know, but um, I auditioned for Gimli uh, early on, and he thought I was out to get him for a while. I think at one event, I actually kind of stormed the stage when he was doing a presentation like this and shouted at him, he stole a role from me. Um, but uh, he took it very well. He only punched me once. But no, he's a lovely man and, uh, you know, that was a case of really not being able to find enough short actors to fill all the roles. So therefore you have to resort to another kind of method of, of, of work there. And the technology existed for them to shrink advertised actors, so, um, you know, if you need the diverse sort of range of characters and performances, you're going to have to look further afield. So I kind of understand why they went with John for that and other kind of average size actors. Warwick, well, I want to thank you for these very honest and heartfelt answers. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for.